Well, good evening or good afternoon. Good, good afternoon. <laughs> All right, thank you. I, I'm Victor Zhao, the president of the National Academy of Medicine. On behalf of my co-presidents, Marshall McNutt, the president of the National Academy of Science, and John Anderson, president of the National Academy of Engineering, I'd like to welcome all of you to the National Academies. Thank you for joining us for this tonight's very special lecture, which is a Carnegie Institute Capital Science Evening, and it features a distinguished Nobel laureate, Professor Tasaku Hanjo from Japan. And you see that his title of his talk is Serendipity of Acquired Immunity. We at the National Academies are really delighted to host this event uh, and we thank Eric Isaac, who you very shortly meet, president of the Carnegie Science Institute, and his team for bringing this distinguished lecturer to our place. Now, both our organization have long commitment to science and share, we share common values and mission. Our academy is founded in 1863, highlight in our missions, the importance of advancing science and providing science leadership in US and globally. And the Carnegie Science Institute, originally founded as Carnegie Institution in Washington, 1902, is dedicated to scientific discovery. And you're gonna hear more from Eric on their mission, but certainly the application of knowledge to improvement of mankind. So you can see our missions are very much aligned and our, we, our relationship, which I value tremendously. That's why it's such a special occasion that we are actually hosting this event for Connie Science Institute. Today's speaker embraces our key mission and values and we're very honored to have him. And before Professor Hanjo gets a formal introduction by Eric Isaacs, I'd like to say a few words to welcome him. He's a foreign associate of National Academy of Science, so we do know him. And I'm a physician scientist. I still run an active NI supported lab and I'm interested in cardiovascular science. So I've always been interested in ways to cure disease and to improve health. But I think few discoveries have as much an impact as Dr. Hanjo's work. I just returned from the Nobel Forum at the Karolinska Institute two weeks ago, where I spoke on the topic of bio-inspired medical breakthroughs. So I gave examples of penicillin, statins, ACE inhibitor, kind of some of my own work in the early years, but I also mentioned cancer immunotherapy, Dr. Hanjo's work. And the president of KI, Oli Peter Otterson, in his speech specifically mentioned Dr. Hanjo. And he talked about Dr. Hanjo's remarks at the Nobel ceremony and said that, he said, cancer can be attacked by releasing the breaks in the immune system. So that clearly is what you're gonna hear in a very exciting way. So I think Dr. Hanjo's work, which you'll hear about on PD-1 and inhibition has saved many lives, cured cancers. I think about our president, Jimmy Carter, who's actually benefited from immunotherapy, and I just saw him on television just a few days ago. So Dr. Hanjo, it's a great honor for the National Academy to welcome you and to have the opportunity to hear your lecture. And I will now turn the podium over to Eric Isaacs, who will introduce you more formally. Thank you. Good evening. Um, my name is Eric Isaacs, and I'm president of the Carnegie Institution for Science. And I'm really especially proud to be here to introduce Dr. Tasuko Honjo, um, uh, an exceptional scientist whose work, work has been transforming medicine and saving lives. I do want to thank uh, Victor Zhao, uh, who is, as he said, president of the Academy of Medicine, and also Marsha Becknott for offering to co-host us here tonight for this uh, remarkable lecture. So as you may know, Carnegie Institution has been renowned for more than a century for the extraordinary work of our researchers. The roster of Carnegie scientists um, has really been remarkable over the years and for their achievements and they're transforming our understanding of our world and our universe. I'd like to name a few. Uh, Edwin Hubble, who revolutionized astronomy um, with, with his observation of galaxies beyond the Milky Way, which of course ultimately led to the observation that the universe is expanding. Vera Rubin, 
whose work on galaxies, mostly nearby, confirmed the existence of dark matter in the universe, even though we still have no idea what it's actually made of. <laughs> Barbara McClintock, whose transformational discovery that genetic elements can sometimes change position, some so-called jumping genes on a chromosome, which could ultimately lead to inheritable traits, was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1983. And Andy Fire, whose 2006 Nobel Prize um, recognized his elucidation of RNA interference, which allows the regulation of flow of information from RNA, uh, sorry, from DNA to RNA. But Carnegie Institution uh, plays, also plays a crucial role in the scientific enterprise by serving to, as a launch pad for early career scientists, scientists who join us particularly as postdocs. While they are with us, our postdocs, talent and creativity bring fresh ideas, a diverse viewpoints, and boundless energy to the work that we do. As they move forward in their careers, they serve not only as ambassadors for Carnegie Science, but they go on to build their own careers, and we take special pride in their success. And so tonight, it is really a distinct pleasure to be here with Dr. Honjo, who spent two formative years as a postdoc fellow at the Carnegie Institution, at the Carnegie Institution's Department of Embryology uh, in Baltimore. It has been deeply meaningful for us to hear Dr. Honjo credit his Carnegie mentor, Dr. Don Brown, for encouraging him to tackle some of the most fundamental questions in immunology. Dr. Honjo comes to us tonight from the Kyoto University Institute for Advanced Study, where he serves as a distinguished professor and deputy director general. He also is professor of immunology and genomic medicine at the university's graduate school of medicine. He is a native of Kyoto, and Dr. Hanjo earned his, an MD as well as a PhD in medical chemistry at Kyoto University. He then came to the United States as a research fellow, first at the Carnegie Institution and then as a visiting fellow and associate in the Laboratory for Molecular Genetics at the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development at the NIH. He spent several years on the faculties of Tokyo and Osaka universities before returning to Kyoto University as a professor. Among his many honors and awards, Dr. Hanjo is a member of the Japanese Academy and German Academy of Natural Scientists, a foreign associate of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, as Victor Zhao has already mentioned, and an honorary member of the American Association of Immunologists. And in 2017, Dr. Hanjo was honored with the International Kyoto Prize in Basic Sciences, which is Japan's highest private award for global achievement. Throughout his long and distinguished career, Dr. Hondro's research has focused on the mechanisms that regulate the body's immune system, specifically the molecular brakes that keep our immune cells from attacking our own bodies. Like a car's brakes, as I'm sure he'll describe in much more detail, like a car's brakes prevents it from getting too revved up and accelerating out of control. These molecular brakes, known as immune checkpoints, hold our immune system back from basically over-responding and destroying itself, and destroying our own healthy cells. So these breaks serve to prevent dangerous autoimmune responses, but they also can inhibit the body from fighting some types of cancer cells. So Dr. Hondro's research into the mechanisms of these immune checkpoints and their interactions with cancer cells led to his remarkable discovery of PD-1, a checkpoint protein on the surface of T-cells. His discoveries have led to the development of new immunotherapies that can release these breaks stimulating the body's own immune system to attack tumor cells and to fight off advancing tumors. This groundbreaking work was recognized last year by the Nobel Prize in Medicine or Physiology, which he shared with fellow immunologist Dr. Jim Allison. The cancer immunotherapies that have been developed from these discoveries are less harmful to human tissue than, for example, the radiation, chemo, and classic chemotherapy and surgeries that are so commonly used uh, and less likely to ca cause unmanageable side effects. And today, immunotherapies based on Dr. Hanjo's research are approved for treating melanoma, bladder cancer, colorectal cancer, and, and many other different cancers. So it is a great pleasure here to, to be here tonight with Dr. Hanjo to, to hear him talk about the path that led him to find PD-1, the serendipities of discovery, and the ways in which our own immune system can be harnessed to fight cancer. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Tasuko Hanjo. Thank you very much, very elaborated introduction. I'm very much moved. It's my great honor and privilege 
uh, to give a talk in this uh, historical auditorium. Uh, I'd like to start uh, from my personal history. I was born in the family of a surgeon. The first memory I ever had in my life is burning on the back of my mother running through the fire. That was the uh, event uh, which occurred two months before the end of the war. And we were living in the city called Toyama, rather rural city on facing the Japan Sea, but very strong strike, air bomb uh, caused such a misery. And we are very fortunate because the bomb just went through our shelter ceiling down to the earth where the water blocked the explosion. And the bomb was very close. If it were a few inches off, we, I'm not here. So from the beginning of my life, I've been very fortunate. So the first occasion I got interested in natural science is the event when the uh, elementary school teacher set up the telescope on the playground and I saw this Saturn very, very, not such beautiful, but very, very tiny ring. But it fascinated me and I thought I wish to go there and see what's there. I want to see the end of the universe. So I got interested reading the book about the universe and I wanted to be astronomer. But that dream eventually faded away. Uh, oh, I want to show this slide. Uh, you can see th this is the beautiful picture of the Earth taken from Cassini, from the you know, satellite. Uh, now, so my dream to become astronomer faded away because my mother gave a book about the Hideo Noguchi who struck to become a doctor from the extreme poverty and he came to the United States at the age of 23 and hired by Flexner at the Rockefeller Institute at that time and he studied the progressive paralysis is caused by uh, syphilis, spiroheater. And then he tried to identify the pathogen for yellow fever and he went to Africa and died there because of this pathogen infection. So his struggling and enormous passion really motivated me to become a doctor and probably that was a trick my mother and uh, <laughs> I was very lucky again to meet my mentor, Osamu Hayaishi, uh, famous biochemist who spent more than 10 years in this country soon after the war and came back to the Kyoto University and introduced very modern biochemistry and very international atmospheres. Thanks to his uh, introduction, I could meet in person with the famous uh, Jack Mono. Uh, I think he already got Nobel Prize at that time, but his paper about gene regulation fascinated many young uh, people in that field. I worked on Jeffrey's toxin as a thesis in my graduate school, and I fortunately discovered the toxin is actually the enzyme catalyzing the modification of protein synthesis component called EF1, EF2, just transferring part of the NAD onto enzyme king this function. So with this uh, publication, I applied to go abroad. I applied several fellowships, but I was uh, successful, but fortunately, 
Carnegie offer the position with stipend, and that's why I met Don Brown at the Baltimore. This encounter was again very fortunate because he came back from a summer in Woods Hall. He just read many books which he never worked on, that immunology. And he introduced me, the time has come to work on the mystery of immune response, which was very famous among every biologist. So the question is why animal can respond to almost all different type of antigens. Famous scientist Lan Steiner took all man-made compounds like nitrobenzene, nitrophenol, all these are artificial compounds conjugated with protein injected animal. And surprisingly, animal generated specific antibody to any of the compounds which animal probably had never seen before. So this kind of the infinite, apparently infinite reactivity puzzled many biologists. Why? How? This question was one of the most mysterious, but I thought this is unattackable. But Don said, now the DNA, DNA structure, DNA code, genetic code, and also reverse transcriptase allowed us to make the cDNA and eventually gene cloning possible. Why don't you work on this project? So I was fascinated and asked where I can work on that. That's the moment I got involved in the question of immunoglobulin diversity. Structure of the antibody protein was already revealed by a number of scientists. Basically, the protein containing light chain and heavy chain is linked by the disulfide bond, and two chains both contain the variable region at the N terminus and C terminus region at C terminus. And the variable region responsible for binding different type of antigen. Each variable region combined specifically binds specific antigen. The C region plays a different role that used for the how to destroy or where to attack the antigens. The question of this enormous diversity. Uh, was the subject in the field leader's lab, NIH. So I moved to NIH and worked with the field leader almost two years. And the strategy we took is to make a cDNA from purified immunoglobulin messenger RNA and count the number. The number of the immunoglobulin gene was amazingly very low. That is the number of the constant region. But the variable region, which I just showed, is specific to the each antigens. And from the protein sequence, the, this portion must be high number. But C region is very small, one at most few. So there must be some strange genetic change going on. Otherwise, it's almost impossible to explain. So that's the conclusion I got after two years work in Philida's lab, and I went back to Japan. And our speculation was subsequently 
shown, demonstrated clearly by Tone, Susumu Tonegawa, he clearly showed later that the viable region that binds to antigen is split into several pieces on the germline genome, and each segment of the okay, subgenomic part of the uh, gene is reassembled during embryogenesis or differentiation. This is the mechanism create combinatorial diversity. I went back to University of Tokyo, and there I first uh, met Professor Mano, and he told me, Dr. Honjo, welcome back. <laughs> you can do whatever you want. I'm very much surprised. At that time in Japan, it was almost impossible. The faculty, new faculty has to work for prof full professor. But he added, but we don't have money. <laughs> so that means I have to raise money. But it's more important is what I should work on. I'm free to work on anything. Of course, antibody diversity is very interesting, but I thought it's impossible to compete with Phil Leader or Tonegawa at that time. So I have to spend uh, years to think or to find best project I could establish in University of Tokyo. And fortunately, I came to the conclusion the another type of diversity involved in the antigen recognition, namely repeated injection of antigen create memory in immunoglobulin genes. That was shown by the change of isotype. So first injection induced IgM first followed by IgG, but second time it changes the order first IgG quickly and IgM. In addition, the antibody binding to the antigen is far more stronger after second injection. This is the log plot of the binding, almost thousand fold stronger binding antibody created. So these observation already done, but people didn't understand the mechanism. Somatic hypermutation was thought for the basis of the increase of affinity, that when B cell, the lymphocyte, which generate antibody, see the pathogen by the antibody expressed on the surface of the cell, stimulate it and expands. And during this enormous expansion, immunoglobulin gene introduced mutation, and among those most strongly binding uh, immunoglobulin producing cell expand, and this is the mechanism, kind of Darwinian principle to generate most effective antibody in our body. Another question is why IgM is switched to IgG by the secondary injection of antigen. The immunoglobulin heavy chain has different isotypes. IgM first produced and switch to IgA, G, or E, each has different function, location, or the target. Now, why this can happen? Keeping the same antigen specificity, namely B region didn't change, but C region changed. So this question fascinated me, 
I started working on this project and fortunately several good students joined my group and I worked five years in University of Tokyo and later I moved to Osaka University. And I eventually we solved this question, namely immunoglobin genes are arrayed on one chromosome and this segment, big segment is looped out during the class switching. Stimulated B cell change the isotype from IgM to, in this case, IgG2A by deleting big chunk of the DNA from the chromosome. We could show this by isolation of the DNA and sequencing completely. Next question, obviously, how to catalyze such big job to cut the chromosome and we like it. We wish to identify the enzyme and fortunately we found the one cell line called CH12 cell stimulated by several factors switched to IgM to IgG and therefore we compare the express gene during this switch and identified the enzyme called activation induced cytidine deaminase, often called AID or AID, which is specifically expressed switching B cells, in this case, germinal center. So this gene was candidate for class switching, so we made a knockout and antigenic stimulation allowed to generate IgM, just like the heterozygote, but didn't express IgG when AID is deleted from both chromosome, clearly indicating AID responsible for class switching. And how about hypermutation? This is the amino acid in the V region and this blue area is a cluster of hypermutation in wild type or heterozygote which contains AID, but clearly AID absence completely eliminated mutation. So one protein, AID, is responsible for both hypermutation and class switching, essential component of antigenic memory that's the basis of vaccination. And this finding was further confirmed in human study in collaboration with the French group, Alan Fisher and Drandi, and they have collection of patient called hyperallergenic syndrome type two. These patient have no class switching, no hypermutation, and they checked their AID genes and all patient had a mutation or deletion of AID. So AID is responsible for the both hypermutation class switching. So basically outline of immunoglobulin diversification was solved by the finding of Tonegawa at the differentiation step combinatorial diversity generation and the B cell which completed such recombination go to periphery and see the antigen and that stimulate expression of AID and <coughs> this can introduce hypermutation to make further sophisticated specific antigen binding V region and also switching the C region by class switch recombination. So this enzyme cut the DNA and during repair, they produce such mutation and cut and re-ligate to generate class switch recombination. Because AID cuts immunoglobin gene, it's very dangerous to the genome and 
sometimes they can form tumors. Touching the genome is very dangerous event. Normally, immune system is the guardian of the genome or our body. So this was really unexpected. In fact, immune surveillance against cancer was proposed long time ago by Sir Mac Macfarlane Burnett, 1970. And he theoretically proposed cancer cells are not cells. It must be something different. So therefore, immune cell always watch when the first time cancer appears and most of the cancer seeds are eliminated. Many people try to prove his hypothesis. Such trial like cancer vaccine generation, purifying the special antigen from tumor cell and inject, try to cure, or taking a lymphocyte from patient and giving cytokines like IL-2, expand T cell and put back patient. Uh, Rosenberg experiments and others tried injection of new cytokines, gamma interferon, IL-2, IL-12, many others. But all these trials didn't prove the concept of Burnett. The major reason was all these trials was just push the immune system, always push, 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 and they didn't realize immune system is regulated in another way, namely the balance between the negative regulation or positive regulation is very important immune system. The first negative regulator, CTL4, which I think is equivalent to parking brake, paired with ignition of CD20, which plays a critical role at the activation phase of lymphocyte. This protein was originally found by a French group, Pierre Gostin, but the function was unknown until uh, several group, uh, Arin Sharp and Takmak, did knockout and showed this is definitely negative regulator. And Jim Monlison used this protein and to show this blockade of CDL4 can activate immune system and can treat the cancer. We totally accidentally encountered the PD-1 and paired with ICOS, this is now known as a brake to control normal driving phase of immune system that can control very flexible way from just like driving 10 kilometer or 100 kilometer. The encounter was very fortunate again. I've been very fortunate, but <laughs> because of this encounter, uh, we last year stepped on the stage of the rehearsal of the Nobel Prize ceremony. We were trying to take uh, our own pictures, but somebody else took other pictures. <laughs> so, first time we found a PD-1 is really accidental. Uh, Yasu Ishid Yasumasa Ishida tried to, then graduate student in my lab, tried to identify the molecules involved program cell death. And we compare the expression of the messenger RNA death induced and normal thymocytes. And he identified the new protein which named program cell death one, and the structure clearly indicate it has a two hydrophobic portion expressed on the 
surface of the membrane. And intracellular domain contains highly conserved soil pyrosin separated rather long space compared to the rest of the signaling molecules known that all these proteins are sh shown to be activation signal deliverer. But PD-1 query at longer distance and we didn't know what the function of the PD-1 and it took us long time to know the function of PD-1 because <coughs> student, not the uh, Ishida, but next student, uh, Nishimura, tried to identify by knocking out uh, PD-1, but didn't find any phenotype for a long time. And finally, after a few years, we could detect nephritis, arthritis, five months by crossing with autoimmune prone animals and subsequently after very long interval we could see clear autoimmunity in wild type animals. So Nishimura was always very much frustrated because no phenotype, no phenotype. Normally, if we don't see any phenotype after three months, the experiments are failure. But fortunately, I got a very good advice from immunologists and that kind of a trick allowed to detect such interesting phenotype, typical autoimmune disease, nephritis, arthritis in white mouse, dilated cardiomyopathy and by crossing diabetes prone animal NOD, the phenotype is quicker and severer and also myocarditis prone MLR crossing. So from this observation, we are convinced PD-1 is a negative regulator of the immune uh, system. And Taku Okasaki subsequently showed molecular mechanism of PD-1 and he demonstrated the PD-1 stimulation induced phosphorylation and recruitment of phosphatase and this phosphatase dephosphorylate activation signal. So therefore, it's a quantitative relative regulation of activation signal. Once we know this, everybody realize immune system is regulated by balance of negative regulation and positive regulation. And if we block the negative regulation that cause stimulation of immune power, and that is good for infectious diseases treatment and also cancer. But the other side of the coin is a risk of autoimmunity. So why not try the most interesting experiments, whether we can treat a cancer. So the first experiment I asked my student is to compare wild type and PD-1 deficient animals and inoculate tumor and see if there's any change of the growth rate of the tumor. Of course, this is the final data. It wasn't that clear, but the data first data she brought me clearly different. So I'm convinced because genetics is far better than any other experiments. So I talked with my colleague, Nangahiro Minato, and he generated a very good antibody against the ligand, which paired with the PD-1, and clearly showed growth rate of tumor is reduced by injection of antibody and survival curve certainly supports the cancer is suppressed by anti-PD-1, PD-L1 treatment. My student also tested anti-PD-1 antibody 
can present mes metastasis of melon melanoma, which was injected in the spleen, then to metastasize the liver. The size of liver and the color clearly indicates metastasis and prevention by anti-PD-1 antibody. So from this observation, we clearly convinced, as Burnett predicted, tumor appear to suppress lymphocyte to grow. Therefore, to treat cancer, we have to block this suppressive function of tumor. Probably, at least some of the tumor express ligand to PD-1 that interactions induce negative regulation on lymphocyte. And if we add antibody to block either receptor or the ligand, the break is released and the lymphocyte can attack tumor again. Now, with this principle, we published this work 10 years after we first identified PD-1 in animal models. But next question is how we can bring this to the clinic. It's another big hurdle because by that time, nobody in the field, including doctors and pharmaceutical industry, completely eliminating idea of Burnett. Immune therapy against tumor is no-no to everybody. So for me, it was big hurdle to convince the collaborator to work on the generation of human anti-PD-1 antibody. But it's fortunate, Medalex, uh, venture capital in the United States, found our patent published after a year and a half and approached and they quickly generated human antibody called Nivormon. And this antibody was approved as the investigation new drug by FDA 2006. And this antibody was put in the clinical trial immediately and later in Japan. Again, there was another hurdle because most of the doctor don't believe the cancer immunotherapy. Say, so the recruitment of patient took a long time. Only patient whom doctor thought impossible was sent to this trial and it took you know, from 2006 to 2012, the final report came out from Susan Parian from Hopkins. And the report was nonetheless very striking. 20 to 30% of lung melanoma and renal cancer was responding, either complete or partial. That was striking because most of them are terminal stage of the patient. On top of that, clinician was astonished by this finding, namely, even after you stop the tumor size, this is the zero at the beginning, so increase and reduction. Those patients who showed reduction of the size of the tumor do not regrow even you stop the treatment. So this doable response was unheard of about the chemotherapy. So this amazed many doctors. And subsequently, large number of trial was published. I just introduced one from our own uh, in collaboration with the uh, gynecology department about ovarian tumor, which is very bad tumor. We 
went into phase two trial or two cohort, two different doses. And fortunately, complete response, partial response, and stable disease, stopping the growth, including about 40 to 50% of patients responded. One example show a very quick response after four months, <coughs> almost all big tumor gone and tumor marker quickly went down. We followed these patients and found over five years after stopping the treatment, there was no sign of recurrence. Two patients, both are very healthy now and very active. And sometimes I see patient treated by this uh, clinical trial uh, happily playing golf. A number of clinical study published, I just add one more. This is randomized study of untreated melanoma. So 200 each patient divided randomly who received the typical chemotherapy, dacomazine, and the other nivolumab. And you can clearly see after a year and a half, about 70% of the nivolumab treated patients survive and less than 20% who receive the carbazine survive. So there, ethical committee ordered stopping this trial. Large number of clinical trial allowed the authority to approve this treatment for many different type of cancers. It's gradually increasing. So what is the difference of this treatment compared to the previous uh, cancer treatment? The first, it has less adverse effects because normal cells are not affected. It affects lymphocyte, but it's not damage tumor cell or other cell directly. Secondly, in theory, it can be effective to every type of tumors. So far, thousand clinical trials going on, so the number of the applicable cancer types will increase every year. Most importantly, it has durable effects once it's respond, and you can stop the treatment if the response is significant. Why this happens? The reason is very clear. The long-term investment and research in the cancer genome study. Summarized a few years ago, and it showed almost every single different type of tumors listed, melanoma, and this is the leukemia, all contains mutation, large number of mutation. And this is the mutation in the coding region that changes the protein. So normally it's zero. So most of the tumor express 100 times thousand times, even 10,000 times different proteins on their surface. So they are different from normal cell. Therefore, immune cell can attack. What we learn from these extensive cancer genome projects is clear cancer cell continuously accumulate huge number of mutations and that push the tumor cell express so-called male antigen. That means different from the normal cell. And that is the target of 
immune system. And secondly, actually they found too many mutations and it continuously mutates. So driver mutation, which might have been the driving force to start the tumor, gradually change and there are no single dominant target. So what I mentioned by cartoon indicates the tumor mass treated by chemo and eventually some resistant tumor line, uh, tumor cells regrow and this is repeated by different drug. And fortunately, lymphocyte can recognize all of them as non-self and therefore cancer therapy can be effective to many different type of cancers as long as they have mutations. But this is not final solution because we know there are limited number of patients who respond. Not all patients are responding. Therefore, we need some markers to distinguish responder from non-responder. One marker tumor site that is high mutation rate, that is clearly shown, but not all of them high mutation. It's also important to distinguish individuals' uh, immune power. Some people are very resistant to virus infection, but some are very susceptible. We have to understand why and find a marker to easily distinguish these responder and non-responder. And eventually, most importantly, we have to improve the power of immunotherapy. Two aspects, one is accessibility of lymphocyte to tumor sites and also potentiation of cure, cure killer capacity. Currently, huge number of trials that try to boost PD-1 treatment by combination this is the map of combinatorial trial. And most popular one is combination with anti-CTL4. Anti-CTL4 was first one introduced, but it was not so popular because it has very strong side effect. The knockout of CTL4 animal, unlike PD-1 knockout, die within one month after birth. So it's very strong effect. Chemotherapy, radiotherapy, all the current uh, treatment is combined. In case of chemo, often dose is reduced to avoid side effect and combined with immunotherapy. We have to wait until <coughs> all these trials show any good progress. At least one chemo combination is already approved. So many may come. We took a different approach. We, many others, recognized once T cell is activated, they need enormous ATP, energy, and substrate because they divide very extensively, almost eight hours once eight hours, E. coli divide once 20 minutes, but the size are huge difference. T cells almost thousand fold bigger than E. coli, means T cell requires 100 times more energy production. Activation of mitochondria is very important. So we looked into the some chemical that boost mitochondrial activity and screen and found the agent that activate the co-transcription factor 
PGC1 alpha is very effective. This transcription factor coupled with PIPR activate mitochondrial uh, components transcription and that helps boosting mitochondrial energy. One chemical, bezafibrate, already used in clinic, combined with anti-PD-1, further enforce anti-tumor activity of PD-1 antibody. So this is certainly candidate. We now put this on the clinical trial and we have to go through series of trial, phase one, phase two, phase three, until we reach to the clinic. Another yet important thing we have to consider, not just pushing our treatment, the side effect. PD-1 knockout animals show very complex biology. Not only it allows expansion of T cells, it consumes enormous compounds from the blood. Therefore, it affects metabolite in circulation and that even affects the reduction of neurotransmitter because it consumes tryptophan and also phenylalanine that is precursor of dopamine. So reduction of such neurotransmitter causes strange behavior of the animal. And very similar phenotype occasionally reported in a patient. In addition, interaction with gut microbiota and immune system is already recognized. And PD-1 deficiency is known to cause dysregulation of gut microbiota. This is the data from Dr. Fagalason in Riken, Japan. She showed PD-1 deficiency generate less efficient IgA that capture uh, good bacteria for the host. And this causes unbalanced growth of microbiota especially this E. coli type bacteria, which is not good for the host, expand, and those uh, good for the host is reduced. And this causes very strong activation of host immunity. That has been shown. And interaction between B cell that is responsible for immunoglobulin through the function of AID and regulation of PD-1 expressed on T cells, very critical for the appropriate production of IgA and secrete in the gut. This was the, also the Fagerson group found first, AID deficiency which cannot produce IgA completely absence of IgA. Gut contains strange bacteria, segment fermentous uh, bacteria, and this compared wild type have enormous expansion or enlargement of lymphoid follicles along the gut. And this is the whole body reaction of the immune system, the spleen is enormously expanded. So we wonder if immune system is stimulated, ARD deficient animal may show some difference in anti-tumor activity. And sure enough, this is still unpublished. This is no, non-treated, just straight animal. Injection of tumor normally grow in wild type, but AID deficient animal, the growth is always less, slower. Certainly, this is not anti-PD-1 treated, just normal mice 
shows clear difference in anti-tumor activity. And we suspected this could be the, due to the bacteria. And we made germ-free. And clearly, in the absence of gut bacteria, here the deficient animal, this suppression of tumor growth is gone. So clearly, interaction of bacteria and immune system is working in vivo. So in summary, AID, which my favorite molecule, and PD-1, again, my favorite molecule, two are very important and helping each other to make a balanced immune regulation in our body, and that also requires help of microbiota. And all these regulatory systems interact with even the nervous system and all metabolite. These overall physiology, we know so little at this stage. So, of course, it's important to cure the tumor, but we have to understand more how our whole body is regulated. I'd like to mention some words which was mentioned in the introduction. Actually, this is Andy Coughlin who wrote this article in New Scientist 2016. He quoted the words of the uh, Chen saying, we are at the point where we, are, we have discovered the cancer equivalent of penicillin. He explains the discovery of penicillin changed our fight against the infectious diseases, but it was not the complete cure. It was just beginning. Series of next generation antibiotics finally conquered most of the infectious diseases. That he meant, meaning we need more and more investigation in the field of the tumor treatment. This is my optimistic view. Cancer immunotherapy will eventually expand and finally, I don't know exactly when, I put the question mark. Uh, we hope we don't have to completely eliminate the tumor, especially in elderly, elderly people. Tumor can exist if they stop and we live by the balance of our immune power and tumor, and if they don't disturb our daily activity, <coughs> we consider tumor is a chronic disease. Someday. <laughs> so, uh, to close, I'd like to acknowledge acquired immunity. Last century, we managed to almost conquer infectious diseases. Hopefully this year, cancer might be controlled thanks to acquired immunity, which we got sometime at the beginning of vertebrate evolution. And this enormous specificity allowed us to first survive extensive attack against the pathogens. And because of this longer survival, we now facing the next life-threatening disease, cancer. And again, we begin to see the hope, the same mechanism, acquired immunity, may conquer, help us to conquer the tumor as well. So this is a story of serendipity, of acquired immunity, and also myself. <laughs> I'd like to thank my collaborators. Uh, this is a picture the 10 minutes after I got called from Stockholm. <laughs> and <everywhere. laughs> 
thanks to the long-term collaborator, Dr. Douglasson and Dr. Matsuda. And I'd like to thank the many, many collaborators. I cannot list, uh, it's just occupied many slides. So I just picked up the, only the major collaborators, long-term collaborators. And I'd like to thank the many funding agency. And especially when Professor Mano said he doesn't have any money, I got the money from Jane Coffin Child Memorial Fund, <laughs> where the leader kindly recommended me when I left the United States. Thank you for your attention. Dr. Hunjo for that great talk and, uh, and for your discovery. So um, we have some time for questions, about 10 minutes for questions. So I'd like to welcome some from the audience. Please. Do we, we have microphones. It would be helpful to go to the microphone. Thank you. Uh, hi, Dr. Uh, Hongzhou. It's, it's a very nice talk and uh, you have a very wonderful achievement. I have a question about uh, PD-1, because you mentioned the balance in the immune system, the immune checkpoint, and also active immune response. So do you see any consequences about autoimmune response happen in those patients receive uh, anti-PD-1 therapy? Can you repeat the last part? Of uh, do you, in clinicals, do you see any um, autoimmune response that induced the autoimmune response after a patient receive uh, NTPD-1 uh, okay. therapy? So you're asking the side effect of the immunotherapy, and uh, yes, uh, it certainly shows very typical autoimmune diseases. About 10% of the patient uh, show some um, side effects. And, uh, but most of the cases, most of the cases, it's uh, curable by stopping the antibody injection and treating by a steroid. But some cases, fatal, because I believe most of the cases, doctors who are specialists in oncology don't realize the autoimmune disease symptom early enough to avoid fatal uh, process. So, answer, simple answer is yes, but it's uh, controllable. Okay. One for, go to this side and then back to Chris. Go ahead. Uh, do you have to, is PD-1, is that one chemical or do you have to tweak that and tailor it to the different cancers that you're trying to control and also the timing does it matter how long the tumor has set in in other words the, is it better quicker okay pd1 is a molecule but it's a protein big structure so to block pd1 we need relatively large structure single small molecule, it's very difficult to block the interaction PD-1 uh, with its ligand. So therefore, we use antibody. The second question, yes, definitely it's better to treat earlier, but there are many reports big tumor can be treated and completely eliminated. So. The simple answer is yes, better to treat earlier. It's kind of the golden rule to any tumor. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much for that inspiring talk. Uh, I'm a professor of computer science who studies using visualization, visual analysis of data to make discoveries. And I'm wondering if you could share with us when you're thinking about and problem solving 
how do you think? Is it visually with, with graphs and histograms or images or how is it that you see these things in your mind? Well, that's a difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> well, certainly we biologists have some imaginatory picture of what's going on, but uh, we cannot draw so clearly as uh, you computer scientists. So we have some very, always very rough, very crude handwriting image picture when we discuss. So is that the answer? <laughs> Do you, do you think about it visual? Do you think it visually when you're thinking about it, or do you think it, it in 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 letters? Do you think about DNA sequences and letters? Oh, no, no way. We we always have some visual image. What's going on? Yeah. Thank of you. Of course. <laughs> Please. Uh, sorry, it's me again. I just have a question about. <laughs> Uh, since uh, PD-1 can be recognized by pd one which is on the cancer side, so why not use anti-PD-1 instead of anti-PD-1? Especially in your talk, uh, you mentioned about PD-1 actually favor B cell response. Actually, both are used, so it doesn't matter. PD-1 blockade or PD-1 blockade. It's important to inhibit their interaction. But in theory, I believe, and actually there are some indication, PD-1 blockade is more effective because there are another ligand called PDL2, which is a uh, minor. So therefore, PD-1, L1 blockade is as effective as uh, PD-1 blockade. So I'd like to ask a question. So there's a, uh, it started with surgery, then, uh, um, chemotherapy and now immuno, immunotherapy. Um, what's next? I mean, you have PD-1. Is PD-1 unique? Are there other things that you could imagine inventing to fight cancer? Well, actually, there are several other uh, negative regulator, uh, something like dozen. Many people tried to use that as a second project or a combinatorial. And so far, uh, what I heard is not that effective. So people are trying to think other way to combine with a different strategy. Please. Uh, if, uh, if people already have an autoimmune disease, does that make them somehow either not so predisposed to cancer and or more responsive to cancer immunotherapy treatment, and um, can this um, um, cancer immunotherapy be used uh, prophylactically before anybody gets cancer to prevent them from getting cancer? That's what I'm wondering. I don't think we can prevent <laughs> uh, because uh, of the side effect. So if you continue to inject, uh, stimulate the immune system, probably we expect other side effect. So unfortunately, the preventive uh, caution, cautious uh, activation of the immune system it may not be a good idea. Okay, let's take one more question. I think you were here first, so sorry. I mean, <laughs> all right, all right, fine. We'll do two. Go yeah, ahead, you go, and then you go, and then that's before, it. Before, oh, sorry. Go ahead. He you was start. there before I got here, so I feel bad. If okay, you go first, and then you can go, and then we'll finish. It's fine. Okay, so I have a two questions. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try do one. Okay, so simple one first. Can I have a selfie with you after this? <laughs> Okay, that's okay. a thousand questions. <laughs> and second one, uh, to reach the immunotherapy in the level of uh, antibiotics like a penicillin, 
it should also work for non-hypermutated tumor. So I want to know what you think, what do we need to seek out to address that? Well, uh, there is no non-mutated tumor. There are some mutation, but uh, less mutated, I should say. A typical case is a leukemia. So for that type of tumor, people now uh, introducing so-called CAR-T, which target specific antigen on that particular tumors. So that shows a uh, significant effect. So we should choose different strategy, both uh, based on the immune system, but slightly different way. Okay, last question. Dr. Honjo, thank you for the enlightening talk. I'm gonna make the question brief. Um, is there any work underway or have you looked at any um, effects of other immunosuppressant drugs like rapamycin or caloric restriction? Um, or is there any work underway potentially to look at the affinity for PD-1 uh, checkpoint inhibitors in combination or potentially just the action of caloric restriction or immunosuppressant drugs that are similar? Well, rapamycin, all those are immunosuppressant. So that's... Uh, goes opposite to the anti-PD-1. PD-1 itself is suppressive. So PD-1 antibody is blocking suppression, so it boosts. So rapamycin is suppressed, so it goes opposite way. Okay, let's thank Dr. Hanjo for his wonderful work. <laughs>